morning. Welcome to you on this 22nd Sunday after Pentecost, October 20th. Uh, yeah, this morning when I got out of the house, it was my heat was on, <laughs> um, and it, it's it's a little chilly this morning as we came in. But then we were met with the radiance of sunshine that warms us up. So uh, we're glad that you are here this morning, um, friends. Let us join our hearts and our mind for the worship of God. Please join me for the call to worship. Come, let us worship God who created all things. We worship God who laid the foundation of the earth, who makes the morning stars sing together, who sends forth lightning and gives wisdom and understanding. Come, let us lift our voices in praise. Let us pray. Our soul bless you, O God, for your imagination that created us, your wisdom that guides us, your example that inspires us. Help us to follow your way, to mold our lives after yours, and reflect your image to all we meet. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 14, For the Beauty of the Earth. Astray. 
But like a faithful, loving shepherd, God seeks us out and calls us home. Let us then confess our sins before God and our neighbors, trusting in the mercy of our Lord. Let us pray the prayer of confession. Lord Jesus Christ, you know our sin. We want you to do whatever we ask of you, but we are unwilling to do what you ask of us. We want to sit beside you in your glory, but we fail to stand beside you in your suffering. We want to be first in the great kingdom, but we are among the last to serve the least. Forgive us, pour out your mercy upon us, and wash us clean in your saving grace. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen. <coughs> Friends, hear the promise of the Lord. Those who love me, I will deliver. And when you call me, I will answer. I will rescue you from danger and show you, show you my salvation. Believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end Amen Amen Friends, Jesus said Peace I give to you Peace, my peace I give to you I do not give what the world gives Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Friends, whenever we experience this peace of Christ in our hearts, let us share it with those around us. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Let us turn to our neighbor and exchange sign of peace to one another. Let us pray the prayer of illumination. O Lord, by the power of your Spirit, lift us up in your presence to bear, to hear the promise of your word and know the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture this morning comes from Paul's letters to the Hebrews, chapter 5 verses 1 to 10, Hebrews chapter 5 verses 1 to 10. Here now the reading of God's words. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own, for his own sins, as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God just as Aaron was. So also, Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications 
with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized by the baptism that I was baptized with? They replied, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism in which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Now when the other ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them over and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles those whom they recognize as their rulers lorded over them? and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you, you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Friends, this is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Thanks be to God. In the gospel lessons that we just read from Mark, two of Jesus' elite disciples, James and John, came up to him asking him something that perhaps they shouldn't have asked. They demanded a place to sit to his left and to his right when he comes into glory. This came after Jesus had unveiled his identity to his disciples and his explained to them what his ultimate mission of salvation of humanity was about. He hinted to his disciples that soon he, the Son of Man, would be handed over to the authority and be condemned to death. Many of his disciples were caught off guard, not knowing exactly how to respond to Jesus' disclosure. Based on their reaction, we can also catch a glimpse of what was going through the disciples' minds. Well, at least to James and John. They were more concerned about where would they be or where would they stand in place when Jesus was enthroned as the long-expected Messiah. It seems that there was more, that was more important to James and John than their earthly mission at hand. Interestingly, if you uh, 
took it through a little parallel study. In the Matthew's version, it was the mother, it was the mother of James and John who makes such requests on behalf of her two sons. Instead of focusing upon what is going to happen to the teacher, James and John were focusing upon themselves. They made a bold request, or more like a demand, asking Jesus, Jesus, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. I don't remember anyone make such a request from Jesus, like a commanding fashion. We want you to do whatever we ask. The key word is whatever, anything. That's like signing a blank check to somebody and here, fill in the blank. Whatever we want, we want it now. How dare these two disciples make such requests out of Jesus? What were they thinking? Perhaps they didn't even know what they were asking. Like the rich young man that whom we read last week, these two disciples were looking for a place of security concerning their future. They were they were looking after their own interests while seeking for their placement of importance and status. Their incredible, incredible request appeared to be an act of self-absorption or self. Glorification. I don't see where I, I want to see where I stand. You know, am I Jesus' left hand or right hand man? Rather than motivated by their passion to serve in the kingdom of God. This wasn't quite exactly what Jesus had in mind when it comes to ministering and serving in God's kingdom. Jesus turned this conversation, like he has in other occasions, into a teaching moment regarding one's motivation to serve and what it means to become his disciples. Remember what Jesus' response was to these two brothers? He said, You do not know what you're asking. To sit in my left and my right is not mine to grant. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave or servant of all. This whole notion concerning the kingdom of God was still a novel concept to many, including many of Jesus' disciples. His style of leadership was not quite the same as what, the follower, what his followers were expecting. They were still thinking that one day Jesus will become a military leader and they will be there, you know, to establish, he will be there to establish his reign in his kingdom. To much of their disappointment. These disciples wanted to assure themselves a proper place whenever that happened. This concept or the understanding of definitions of servanthood is, was paradoxical. It's a paradox. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant or slave. Or whoever wishes to be first among you must be servant or slave of all, Jesus said. The kingdom of God is not about how high we elevate ourselves up on the pedestal or declare ourselves more righteous than others. But instead, it's about seeing the fullness of life as God intended from a renewed perspective through personal giving and self-humility. We see things from the eyes of others instead of ourselves. This paradoxical view towards greatness defines what the kingdom of God looks like. Greatness 
is defined not through our human accomplishments or achievements, but through our humility, our giving and sharing of ourselves. Jesus demonstrated his greatness through his servile attitude. And ultimately, we all must be held accountable also to God and to God alone. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus was willing to put himself out there at the front line, going against the the social norm, challenging the established order and authority. Even though he was a king, he humbled himself and exemplified himself as a servant among the people. Those who are poor, those who are sick, those who are lonely, those who are considered as outcasts. Ultimately, Christ did something that probably no other king has ever done. He got down on his knees and washed the disciples' feet with his hands. That's his model of servant leadership. This can all be summed up in one verse. Verse 45. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Through his spirit of humility and humbleness, Jesus demonstrated a model of greatness for all of us to emulate and to follow. And as the Apostle Paul wrote, in his letter to the church in Philippi, he wrote, though he was in the form, describing this servant, servant king, he said, though he was in the form of God, he did not regard his equality with God as something to be exploited. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death upon the cross. In the other lesson that we read earlier from the letter to the Hebrews, we came across a description of the high priest who was a man chosen among the mortals and was put in charge of many things pertaining to God on behalf of God's people by offering gifts and sacrifices for their sins. The high priest was the human agency to the divine authority. Likewise, when Christ came, he also fulfilled that priestly role as the high priest but also as the Son of God. He offered himself as the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of humanity. Christ did not glorify himself, even though he was the Son of God. But instead, he offered up prayers and supplications on behalf of the people by submitting himself in the reverence his father. As verse 9 reminded us, although he was a son, son that is with a capital S, he he was the son of God, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obeyed him. through our two selected texts text this morning, we can draw a, the following conclusion that true greatness of servanthood comes from one's humility and obedience to others. A great leader demonstrates the mind and the heart of a servant by willing to put others before himself or herself. 
people will notice one's greatness by the seeds that one scatters and by the fruits that one bears upon the lives of others. In the same way, our attitude towards servanthood shall be based upon mutuality, trust, and accountability. It's not about who is placed higher than the others or who gets to sit on the left and right of Jesus. It's a lateral relationship with an invitation for all to contribute and share alongside with one another. Friends, the role to the role of discipleship will have its ups and downs, twists and turns. Servanthood is never about us, but instead it is about lives that are changed through God's work in us as God's servants in the priesthood of all believers. True servant leadership is exhibited through one's characters of grace and humility. Instead of leading from the front or under the spotlight, let us lead from the back and on the sideline, cheering on with one, with one another. And as the, the late South African President Nelson Mandela once said, when it comes to being a servant leader, he said, quote, it is better to lead from behind and to put others in front especially when you celebrate victory when nice things happen. You take the front line when there is danger and people will appreciate your leadership. Through this his sacrificial giving and suffering upon the cross, Christ demonstrated his ultimate obedience to the Father and called upon us to emulate his greatest triumph his greatest triumphant glory was not displayed upon the throne but instead upon the hill where he was crucified alongside with two convicted criminals one on his left and one on his right Christ did this out of his sacrificial love for all who confess their faith and believe in him. This sacrificial agape love is mutual. It's self, it's unselfish and charitable kind of love. And as Paul wrote to the church in Corinthians, uh, to the church in Corinth, he said, this agape love is patient. It is kind. It is not envious or boastful. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things, and endures all things. I'm sure many of us are familiar with this passage in 1 Corinthians. However, it's often misinterpreted or misapplied. This definition of God's agape love is not just something we of, it's not just what we often associate with a marital relationship. But instead, it draws upon and sets us, set for us a model of relationship with one another. How we must follow and emulate throughout demonstrated in our everyday lives. And particularly how we relate to one another. Or when whenever we see someone in need. Friends, we love because God has first loved us. And we serve because God has already served us. So therefore, let us go and do likewise. Thanks be to God. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and 
God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bear with me for a moment, please. Having some issue with the PowerPoint this morning. Okay. Friends, let us respond by singing hymn number 320, The Church of Christ in Every Age. Thanksgivings uh, that we may have uh, for others and for ourselves, all for ourselves. Yes, Kara? Yeah, um, 
Is that a hand? Ray? Uh, my eldest grandson, James, he's a senior in high school now. And I uh, want a prayer that he has uh, quite a good pathway to college. James, right? Yes. Yeah, I remember. He's a senior now? Wow. I remember he was like this now, now it's probably like this. <laughs> Uh, you notice that uh, David uh, Fong is not here today, and he and his wife are in in Hong Kong, and uh, uh, his his I think his mother is not you know feeling well. Uh, that's why they're making this trip to go visit her. So uh, pray for uh, David uh, David Fong's mother and their trip. Uh, I think David is coming back next Tuesday. Uh, David Fong's mom and David and Becky. Let us join our hearts in prayers. So let us pray. Holy and loving God, we offer our thanks to you as we study your words this morning and we see the incredible love that you share as the servant, the servant who set an example for us, teach us to remind us to be what it means to be a servant leadership, to be in servant leadership. Help, help us to humble our hearts and to see the needs of others before ourselves. Lord, we pray for those, the needs of those around us, especially those who are not feeling well, those who are sick, those who are injured, and those who might be hiding their emotions and feelings that we know, that we see, that we often don't see, but we know that they, some of them uh, might be hiding their pain deep within. We know, you know their needs, you know their struggles. We pray that you will continue to care for them. We pray for those who are physically in need of prayers this morning, for many of those who are ongoing uh, recovery from various health concerns of Peggy, with, especially with Peggy and Eileen, for the recovery for, for uh, Kara's aunt, for her surgery. And we also pray for um, David's mom, uh, David Fong's mom in Hong Kong, for her health. Uh, we pray that uh, you would continue to guide David and Becky as they're visiting them right now in Hong Kong. And we pray for their safe return uh, next week. Uh, we also lift up many of the students uh, who are making plans for the future, especially we lift up James this morning as he's graduating this academic year. We pray for his making the right decisions of concerning his future uh, and his plan of what school he may apply, might be applying to, give him wisdom and uh, the families who are supporting him every step of the way. We pray for others as well as they're making uh, choices, important choices of life and jobs that they're searching perhaps and or perhaps those who are looking for different jobs as well. We lift it all up to you. All this we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus the Christ who taught us to pray saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Oh, hi, Paul. Hey. Uh, just a note that for our offering, you may use our offering plates in the back table. Uh, on your way out, you may uh, leave your offering there. Uh, or you may uh, continue to make your online contribution as well. Um, go to our website or go to the QR code. You may also uh, make your contribution that way as well. Thank you for your ongoing contribution and support. Our Wednesday evening Bible study will be uh, on chapter 8. We're on chapter 8 this week of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, anyone is uh, still welcome to join us and uh, we'll be meeting at 7.30 by Zoom. For those who have missed the uh, photos, uh, this will be our last week to, if you want to be on the in the picture, uh, please uh, stay behind and I can take a makeup picture. Uh, there are a couple of shots that I got to clone in, uh, so I want to do it all at once. So I don't want to, I don't want to hold up the time too long. So if you, if you didn't take it as a group, as part of the group picture and you still want to be a part of it, uh, please let me know and I'll get your picture uh, later on, after, right after service, okay? Friends, let us then conclude our worship this morning by singing hymn number 462. I love to tell the story. Like the rest, 
and where is in of glory I sing the new new song will be the old story that I have loved so long I love to tell the story will be my theme in glory to tell the old story of Jesus and his love. Amen. Friends, let us continue to go and tell our story. For the Son of Man came to serve and not to be served. So let us follow Christ's example, share our abundant gifts, talents, and resources with those around us. In the name of our Savior, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all till we meet again. And all of God's people say, Amen. Farewell, good friends. Farewell, good friends. Shalom, shalom. Till we meet again. Till we meet again. Shalom, shalom. Farewell, good friends, farewell, good friends, shalom, shalom, till we meet again, till we meet again, shalom, shalom. Please be seated. Friends, may you have a blessed week and be a blessing to others.